Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. It is important that we are able to hear God's voice to benefit from this. Mm -hmm. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Mm -hmm. God has given us ears so that we may hear what is going on around us, whether it be an emergency or a regular conversation. We hear so we may understand and act upon it. In an emergency, sounds or commands give us the urge to get out of danger. And in common talk, we respond in ways that affect the outcomes of it. Mm -hmm. But sometimes hearing things can harm us. Allowing yourself to hear sin and willingly wanting to hear it does not have good results. Yep. Sin and wickedness dulls the hearing. It distracts and keeps you from receiving any be benefit from what you may have from what you hear. Mm -hmm. A filthy <coughs> growth soon covers your ears, preventing anything from being heard. Not being able to hear is a major hand handicap. Amen. We must put off the flesh and turn, tune out, so to speak, anything that is wicked. How do we hear? Christ has given us ears, and he is able to let us hear. Mm -hmm. He circumcised our ear for ears, for sin had made us ignorant of God. Mm -hmm. But we can, and we cannot hear or benefit from anything unless we are able to hear. Christ, God wants us to hear his word. He is willing to uncover our ears, but we must be willing to let him do so. If someone does not want to be saved, God will not save them. So we as hearers must be cautious not to refuse him that speaketh. Why should we not refuse him? Our God is a consuming fire. There is a reason why God says what he says. There is power in his word. With a single word, he, can, he will cast down the evil one. Mm -hmm. We must carefully examine God's word so that we may be pleasing unto him. It is a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of the Lord. So dearly beloved, keep your full focus on Christ and you will not fall. Let not the sound of the winds and waves of the storm in this world turn your attention from the one who is worthy of it. And you are not alone in this. He is able to keep you and for he is the good shepherd. You need only hear him and follow his voice. Amen. 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 <clears throat> the person of God. He is who he is. That's who he is. He is our God. He changes not. By his very own words, he changes not. There are no other gods. God said, I know not any, and if anybody did, it would be God. He knows not any. God does not change. Now, you, when you look at salvation and you see the intense suffering and pain that God has subjected himself to in bringing many sons to glory, you get a, a kind of a, a picture into the greatness of the salvation that God would allow himself to go through such events that he himself would turn, as it were, his face from his own son. See, this, this, this was not without pain for God. God had, had God is not without feeling. And yet he has subjected himself to this because the end is worth what he's doing. See, God's eternal purpose is great and the magnitude of it is great. And as we look at the book of Hebrews and, and actually the, all, of, all of scripture in its entirety, you see God divulging his eternal purpose in, in a manner in which man can comprehend it. Yeah. You can actually comprehend the mind of God and what he's done in the person of Christ Jesus. And you can come to a place to where you can begin to appreciate the person of God and what he's done mm -hmm. and what he's accomplished in his son. See, without this, all of it, God can be as great as great is, and yet we would not be able to comprehend it. It would not advantage us at all. And yet, see, God has worked in such a way to where if you'll just subject yourself unto his word, you will come away from it with a higher appreciation of God every time. You'll see him more clearly. It'll, it'll actually make the race. You, you'll be able to run faster. You'll be able to deny sin. 
You'll be able to cast off the sin and the weight that does so easily beset you. You see, the Apostle Paul saw this. And, and so as he ministers grace to the hearers, as he writes, he does it in such a way to where you, in the end, if you'll subject yourself to his ministry, you'll be able to comprehend more fully the nature of God. You'll be able to, you'll be able to comprehend the context where you've been placed. And, and from that context, you'll be able to navigate to glory. Because unless this can be done, unless in the end you know and be able to comprehend God, you can't stay with him. This is just the way it is. God has never changed. Now this text, this text that actually we read tonight is nothing new. This has been known from the very beginning. Look at this, Deuteronomy. Moses, he says the same word just about. The same exhortation was given by, Mo by Moses when he was about to die. Remember in Deuteronomy 4, verse 22, it says, But I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan. But you shall go over Jordan and possess that good land. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee, for the, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. You won't get away with it. You ignore Jesus. You ignore the one that's speaking from heaven. This whole chapter, Paul's been making comparisons. He'll say something. He'll get your mind thinking and reasoning in one direction. And as soon as you start being able to comprehend it, he'll make a connection. Endure chastening. Why? Because it's for your good, because you're sons. Paul's, Paul's a master at this. Why is Paul a master at this? Because Paul has an understanding of Scripture. That's why Paul's a master at this. Paul can take the things that he knows about God, and now he can bring them to bear on your circumstance, your situation, right where you're at, in the person of Christ Jesus. I don't know if a person would be able to do that if he didn't know the Scriptures. Moses knew all too well that God wasn't going to change. The people were going to be on the other side of the river, but God was not going to change just because they were on the other side of the river. You take, you take an idol? God's not, God is one. He's a jealous God, and he won't let you do it. He won't let you get away with it. Paul knows that the, the, he can see this unchanging aspect about God, and he's been bringing it out. If you'll reason on the nature and person of God, you'll come to the right conclusion. Mm -hmm. In our text tonight, Paul continues his spiritual comparisons. When you start comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, you start getting something done in the spirit. You start understanding. You're, as your uh, understanding is illuminated, your steps they become more frequent. <laughs> They become further apart. You start running the race with endurance. Now, Paul doesn't say, you notice this all through Paul's writings. Paul just doesn't say, you do this because I'm an apostle, and I have the authority to make you do this. That isn't how Paul talks. Although he was an apostle, and he was given special grace. So, I mean, you think about it, Paul could have done this. He had the authority. Listen to this in Ephesians 3.8. He says, Unto me who am least in, of all the saints is this grace given. This grace. Now those of the church would do well to consider what manner of grace the Apostle Paul was given. You're not going to get something independent from the Apostle Paul. God gave him this grace. What grace? That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You can't find it out. It's unsearchable. You can't find But God gave it to Paul. He gave him grace to be able to preach it and to make all men see. Now, you just try that. You just go out there and try to make all men see. What is the mystery of the fellowship? Paul was given grace, this grace. Or he, he could make men see because he had these words. He, he came with him words whereby men could, they could believe. They could see. They could make the connection. He could take the things of Christ and open them up and make them accessible to the people. That's what he's doing tonight. Paul was given this grace. So the apostle Paul, he's been given grace from God to make you see. Not just them, but you also. 
you're benefiting from the ministry of Paul. If you know what the fellowship of the mystery is, you got it from Paul. Paul got it from God. You got it. Paul has a, has a grasp of the scriptures, and he knows how reasonable God is. So he's passing this on. It's reasonable. And so, see, just, just by very, the very nature of scriptures and comparing spiritual things to spiritual things, if you subject yourself, not only the serious will do this, this weeds out all the casual, you know, anybody that would want to casually know God, Paul, weed them out. You don't get anything from Paul casually. You've got to give yourself to it. But if you do, well, see, he'll bring you up higher. He knows that um, these things are reasonable. So if you reason on them with the people, then they'll, the ones that are serious will pick up on it. Faith is reasonable. See, I heard this week that we need faith and science. I'm sorry, that's a lie. What we need is faith. It doesn't say without science it's impossible to please God, but without faith it's impossible to please God. This, this is the way it is. We're living, we're not out there groping in the dark. That isn't the kind of faith that we're talking about here. We're living in the light. See, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's substance. It's evidence. In other words, unbelievers, they can't, they can't see the things that faith gives them. They can't. You, you have to believe that God is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So unless you do that, you can't have the evidence. It's been withdrawn. God took it away. Unbelievers, in other words, need not make an attempt to prove anything in the scriptures because you can't see it without faith. It's impossible. Amen. So we can see why Paul chooses to compare spiritual things to spiritual things because he's talking to those that are operating by faith. He's talking to the church. Paul's not trying to convert the world. He's trying to build up and edify the church. So he talks like this. Paul's been building a structure. The, all of chapter 12 is like a structure. It's like it's one layer built on another layer. And underneath the whole thing, if, if, if you look at any one thing that Paul talked about, and you look back, why is he saying it like this? Because our God is a consuming fire. Now, you know, if this, right, if this single bit of information could be infused into the church overnight, things would change. Amen. Everything you do has to be done with the underneath our God's a consuming fire. Why not become involved in sin? Because our God's a consuming fire. You don't want, see, it's actually dangerous to come close to God. It's very dangerous. If you want to be casual and come close to God, you're in trouble. There isn't anyone that's lived through this experience of coming close to God and being casual. Nadab and Abihu would testify to this. I th just think of a, just a few things. That he's, he starts off this and he says, lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. To, 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 to get, to get your mind thinking like God thinks. Get your mind thinking spiritual thoughts. to work Because he's getting ready to say some things that are really high and lofty. If you're going to be able to comprehend and, and, and stay on track with the Apostle Paul, you're not going to be able to be thinking about the things down here. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to leave them behind. You're going to have to lay some things aside if you want to get to verse 27, 28, 29. You, you, there's a lot of things you've got to get out of the way. Lay them aside. Okay, now let's get to work. Now, now you know, you got some chastening. Some chastening, but you endure it. Why? Because we're getting to some better stuff here. There's some better stuff. Now, you remember those at the foot of the mountain? They couldn't endure. They were at the wrong mountain. We haven't come to that mountain, though. That ain't the mountain we've come to. Not at all. We come to a better mountain. Amen. We come to Mount Zion. Now you've been made, you've been made ready to, to receive from this great God of glory. Paul's calling us to consider this kind of line of reasoning because this is the line of reasoning that will enable you and strengthen you to be able to run the race with endurance. Amen. If that isn't done, it doesn't make any difference what else is done. Yeah. Whatever you said, if in the end you didn't run with endurance. Well, see, God's not going to accept it. Our God's a consuming fire. You say, well, it'll be good enough for God. No, it won't be good enough for God. It won't be. And that's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying they stood on the foot of the mountain. God come down and his foot touched the mountain. And what happened? They said, we are, we exceedingly fear and quake. 
Why? Because our gods are consuming fire. See, this is, God has been misrepresented in the day we live in. If people think they can just casually walk in the presence of God, he's a consuming fire. He will kill you. This is how, this is how he is. See, well, how could God bring people close to him then? He put a representative. Jesus Christ, he's taken away everything that offends God. And now as you get into the person of Christ, you're accepted in the beloved. As you come to Mount Zion, you can come all the way up to the top of the mountain. And you can be fellowship with the God of glory. Yeah. That's how great a salvation that God's wrought in the person of Christ. Paul knows this. How are you going to get the people to know it? Paul, I sometimes I think how frustrated the apostle Paul might have been. He knows these great eternal truths. How are you going to get them into the mind of the people? Look at how brilliant he is. He writes these things, comparing spiritual things to spiritual things, knowing that if you can start thinking on track with him, in the end, you'll come up higher. Now considering who we serve, see, this, this is the foremost, this is what, what Paul is pushing to the forefront. Consider who you say you're serving. Who is this God? This is the thrice holy God. Anybody that's ever approached his throne, look at the book of the Revelation. They'd fall down at his presence. Yeah. This is the God. He hasn't changed. Amen. See, it's unreasonable to sin. It's not reasonable. You look at God, you won't be wanting to sin, that's for sure. See, the Satan gets you distracted. They're thinking about your own circumstances. What? You know, I, I have a family to feed here. This is how practical these things are. Our God is able to give you all things that pertain to life and godliness. But they're in his son. There are some conditions. Amen. Paul knows this. Paul doesn't, he isn't talking like this in order to reveal his superior intellect. Although Paul did have a superior intellect. Uh -huh. See, but it, you would never know it by reading these things. He's a humble person. Why? Why? Because he God's working through Paul. He's taking the things that Paul knows to be true. And he's weaving them in and, and he's presenting them in such a way that that man, these ones he's ministering to, can be advantaged by it. Paul doesn't possess. I uh, know. I'm sorry. Paul does possess a superior understanding of these things. You can see it when you read his writings. See, it's like you you look at it. Like, I would have never known that if Paul hadn't given it to me. Yeah. But see, so he had a superior understanding of God and of of its eternal purpose, and so this is um, it's right. It's right to subject yourself to Paul. I mean, there's some people out there, I, I don't get it from what they say, that, it, that they're subjected, they, they have ever subjected themselves to the teachings of Paul when they start talking about other things, other objectives, other emphasis and focuses. Paul knows that until the truth has been reasoned on in the minds of those who are in the battle, little or no strength is going to be had by them. It has to be reasoned on. It has to be. You say, well, well, I have to give my whole life to this thing. Well, that's one way or another. You're either going to give your whole life to this thing and you're going to be saved from the wrath to come. There is wrath coming. Our God is a consuming fire. See, it's been that way, and I've said this already, but it's been that way from the very beginning. It's not like God's changed or, or sin has made God really angry. Our God's a consuming fire. Remember, he told Moses, I'll be sanctified in them that draw near to me. I will. I'll be glorified in them one way or another. That's right. It's going to happen. See, Paul, Paul actually has the people's benefit at heart. He has the same mind of Christ. He has the same heart that Christ has for the church. Paul has. Paul knows if they continue the way they're going right now, in the end, they'll be consumed. Because our God is a consuming fire. Yes, See, it can't be avoided. This God cannot be avoided. People think. We live in a world right now that people think God's dead. They actually think God's dead. Why? Because they haven't seen him work yet. But when they see him work, it's only going to take one time. They're all going to fall down at his feet. They're going to confess to Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God. God will be glorified in them. Of course, it won't be to their benefit. Paul um, has led the brethren in reasonings that will enable them to properly assess their situation. Unless this occurs, unless you can properly assess your situation right now, you'll do the wrong thing. 
It will happen. But if you can see it in light of eternity, which is another way of saying walking by faith, not by sight. If you can see what your circumstances are in light of eternity, and you can project yourself to the judgment, you'll do the right thing. That's what Paul is depending on. Amen. Now we've come to his final comparison in this chapter. He's, he's, he's built it up to this, and, uh, and, and he's, he's going to make this. This is a qu quite a point he's getting ready to make. See, now this is something you have to do. Uh, the Holy Spirit's going to help us do this. We know that. He's going to give us grace. But the bottom line, he says, see that you refuse him, not him that speaketh. Now, see, he makes the comparison with the ones that did refuse. Remember in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18? Now, this is right after the Lord has spoken his commandments. He's, he verbalized them. He said them. This is what the people said. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. This did not please God. This was not pleasing to God. And they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear. But let not God speak with us lest we die. Now see, this is a response of flesh. People want to serve God in the flesh. This is the response they're going to get. Flesh, they cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It can't. Isn't that you? It, it, it won't. It can't. It's impossible. Amen. It can't receive anything from God. It can't. And Moses said unto the people, fear not. <laughs> I see Moses has come up higher already. Remember, we know that he said we, he exceedingly feared and quaked. But he got past that. Moses, Mo, Moses went up the mountain. Yeah. He went into the cloud. Amen. That's right. See, he's saying, don't fear God. He's the one that did, he, what does he say? Fear not, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces, that you sin not. Yeah. See, Moses knows this is on purpose. This is fearful on purpose so that we won't sin. They could not endure to hear God speaking from heaven. They couldn't endure. Paul making a comparison. He says, you hear, you listen. See that you listen to the one that's speaking now. How much sore punishment will we be deemed worthy of if we don't listen to him that's speaking from heaven now? When the heavens have been opened up, you've been given the Holy Spirit. You say, well, we would never do that. Why the exhortation? The very fact that there's even one exhortation in the scripture proves that you can fall. It proves it. It is possible. Why do I need exhortation? Because I have this sinful body, this body of death, this corruptible. It's soon going to put on incorruption, but we still have to deal with it. Which means we have, we, there's a place for exhortation in the body of Christ that um, it, we can't let it go away. You know, this not, I, I know that this is not popular in the day we live. But who really cares what popular is? What popular is in heaven is what I'm interested in. Amen. These they couldn't endure. Paul's saying, you can endure. You can endure. Look at what he's, the examples that he gave us along the way. See, you, you, you have a great cloud of witnesses. They're like cheering you on. Okay? You, you actually have suffered for the Lord's sake. See, you, you, you've been made ready. You've endured chastening. And now, see, you're, you're at the right mountain. You're in the right person. You can hear him. So you see that you don't refuse it. See that you don't because you can. Well, that really encouraged me. Uh, you know, we, we know Paul developed this thought about God and how serious this is to, to ignore his son. And in the chapter 10, remember we talked about those that despised. It says, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses, of how much sore punishment suppose ye that we shall we be thought of, thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God? You think, that was the last thing I would do. The exhortation's there. Why? It's possible. You see, you want to give all diligence because the opposite of that, somebody said this today, there's only two. It's either pressing forward or you're going back. It's just the way it is. So the exhortation's there to keep us moving. Keep us moving. Keep us on the, on the right track. He's promised soon Christ is going to not only shake the earth, 
but he's also going to shake the heavens. These are things that can't change. It doesn't really make any difference in the big picture, whether or not you believe it or not. It can't change. Jesus is coming, and he's going to shake the earth. And anything that can be shaken, it's going to be shaken. So see, what he's saying is anything in your life that can be shaken, cast it off now. Get rid of it now because you can't have it anyway. It's, see, it's illegal anyway. So as the Holy Spirit illuminates your understanding and you see it clearly for what it is, cast it off. What he's saying, see, what it will cause in you now, it will cause you to not hear the one that's speaking from heaven. The things that, that can be shaken have a, have, a, have a very serious nature about them. They're of the earth and they're earthy. I know that because they can be shaken. So see, since they're of the earth and they're earthy, they're going to cause you to have that covering over the ear to where you can't hear him. Sounds like it's thundering. He's not only going to shake the earth, he's going to shake heaven. Now just God's voice shook the earth once. Just his voice. Can you imagine on the day he sends his son back to this earth and he comes and he comes in all the glory of his father and the glory of the holy angels and the Holy Spirit with him. I just can't. It's, it's, it's going to flee from him. It's just, you're going to fold it up like a garment. I'm done with you now. You've served the purpose. I brought many saints unto glory. And now it's, it's judgment's going to be set. And he that's filthy is going to be filthy still. There's not going to be any time to change, any time to, to be sorry then. Not going to be any time for casting off then. Time's going to be no more. The destruction of the natural order, I mean, this is not the only place. This is like just referred to, actually. I mean, there's, there's very specific places in Scripture right from the beginning. This destruction, Enoch was talking about the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. So we know this has been on God's calendar from the very beginning. God's going to do this. I can, can, can you imagine coming into the presence of a holy God and having sin on you? See, this, Paul, Paul knows that this is the way the Lord is. And so he's illuminating the church. Get them up. Get them, get, them, get them standing on their feet. Get them moving in the right direction. Because otherwise, they're going to draw back under perdition. See, in that time, when they heard God speak, they drew back. Now, how much, how much greater if we draw back under perdition? Well, anyway, you say, well, I don't want to think about these things. So these are some of the things that you think about on the way to glory. He says, of old thou hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Which means that it's okay for God to burn them up. They belong to him. He's going to use them for what he set them for, and then he's going to burn them up. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, wherein only dwelleth righteousness. And we say, even so, come Lord Jesus. There are a lot of wrongs that need to be righted. There are a lot of them. I mean, we, we can't even comprehend all of them. God can He's going to write them all. See, right from the beginning, it's, it's, he, he hasn't forgotten even one of them. The lot of wrongs that are going to be here. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. So how, how do you feel about his word? How serious is it going to be for those who are not ready to meet this God? See, I, I'm, I'm of a strong persuasion that a lot of people don't think that this is the way God is. They've manufactured a God that does, it doesn't react like this. And he's just kind and gentle, and he would never hurt anyone. Our God is a consuming fire. Amen. People whose sins have not been confessed and forsaken will not be able to abide the coming of the Lord. This who shall be able to abide? Oh, my. When he comes in all of his glory. Sometimes things do not always appear as they truly are. Now you can look at the church and you can say, well, I, I think I've got a pretty good understanding of who's in and who's out. There's going to be a lot of people surprised on that day. A lot of people. Some things, there are some today who they have the appearance, but that's all they have is the appearance. They look clean, but they're not really clean on the inside. And we're not given to go through and judge all these things, but God is. And on that day, he says, don't you know we're going to judge angels? So see, these, these things, you, you've been given insight to be able to judge them in yourself. And that's what Paul's calling us to do. 
See that you don't refuse him to speak from heaven. Why? Because that voice, the, the, the teaching of that, what he's doing right now in the person of Christ Jesus is absolutely essential if you're going to be ready on that day. See, you can't, you can't be ready and not hear, hear, listen to Jesus. God takes it personal when you ignore Jesus. Well, you know, some people, they may have created great ministries in the earth, they, if they call them that anymore. I don't know. I mean, they may have millions of people that, that congregate with them, millions of people that come to hear their words. But the question is, is do their words ring more of the earth or of heaven? See, really, we can judge these things now. Yeah. If it, it, when you listen to someone speak, do, they, do you think more of God or more of the earth? More of Christ or more of the earth? Mm -hmm. And to see if, it, if it's more of the earth, well, then you got to cut it off. Yeah. you got to leave that behind. No matter how much it hurts, ultimately how a ministry stands is going to be determined by God. How, when you bring it in the presence of God, is it a real ministry? Because if it is, it'll still stand. It can't be shaken. It was established by God on the earth. He chose his ministers who he wanted to be over this. And on that day when it comes before his presence, he'll say, well done. You took what I gave you to do and you did it right. See, this is... This is the saints. We're looking forward to this, aren't we? Yes. Standing at the judgment, him saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now I'm going to make you I'll make you a ruler over many things. Just come. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. Oh, those words. See, this is what we're longing for. Now we can, we can see things, but we're seeing it through a glass darkly right now. But soon, the, the dark glass is going to be taken away. Very soon the tables will be turned and we'll be the head and not the tail anymore. Not, see, it's, it's just for a little while. He's only asked you to endure for a little while. And see, this truth of our God being a consuming fire, e even though people, I th you know, th they would like to remove this, it sounds quite negative. But see, this this will keep you. This will keep you serious. This will keep you running the race. Wherefore? Now we've come to the turning point of what Paul's been saying this whole time. Paul Paul's uses these wherefores a lot. And where he puts them at is it's always like a pivotal thing. He's getting ready to make a point now. He's getting ready to say something now. Mm -hmm. It's very, listen up now. There's a reason why I'm getting ready to say this. I've said this other thing in order that you might understand this is my main point. We receive in the kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. It's too late to come to this conclusion after Jesus comes. Everyone's going to ultimately come to this conclusion. The ones that come to it ahead before the, before the judgment, they're going to actually benefit from it. You know, I, you know everyone that's come to this conclusion because they're new people. They're not the same as they used to be. They don't do the same things they used to do. They don't think the same thoughts they used to think. Why? Because they've come into a different kingdom. They have a different nature now. Amen. They have a kingdom that can't be moved. You know, people, could, you, they, could, they could die. It wouldn't make any difference. This kingdom that they're in can't be moved. This is the same kingdom that he told Daniel about. Same kingdom. He said, and in the days of these kings shall, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. You've been made a part of this kingdom. This kingdom can't be shaken. When everything else is rocking and rolling and it's all being taken away, you're going to stand firm on a sea of glass mingled with fire. Yeah. So you're not going to be shaken at all. He said, this is our God. We've waited for him to save us. He's, he's come to save us. We've, we've depended on him the whole time. When others were, were crying out for the rocks and the mountains, we depended on our God. See, this is what Paul is, he, is desiring for the people that are reading this letter, that they'll be established in the faith, and they'll be able to stand, even when it doesn't seem possible to stand. This is the same kingdom, same kingdom that Jesus spoke of. Then shall the king say unto him on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. From the foundation of the world. It hasn't changed one bit. 
God's plan for this kingdom. This is the blessed inheritance that Peter talked about. Same thing. He says, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and fadeth not away. It's reserved in heaven for you. Who? For those that have de 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 depended on our God, have faith in our God, are walking, running the race with patience. This is the one who are kept by the power of God through faith. This is the one. You've entered a kingdom that when everything else is shaken, it can't be shaken. Yeah. Ready. Ready to be revealed at the last time. You know, we're, we're looking forward to it being revealed. Actually, this hope is dominating us. You know, I, once you start having this hope, everything else it falls, falls far short of satisfying. You have this hope. Nothing's going to satisfy me except the coming of the Lord. If I die, well, I'll be satisfied with that, I guess. But that's just for a little while. I'm still looking for the, I'm looking for this new heavens and this new earth. I'm looking to have a body that's like unto his glorious body because that's what he promised. See, anything, anything short of that, I, I won't be satisfied with it. This is the same, the same kingdom that we're presently being fitted for. Now, this is a very painful process, and, and Paul sort of went into that some in this chapter. But see, you're being fitted for like a square peg, and, but you don't fit in yet. It, you, you, there's, it, just, it doesn't even look like it's possible for you to fit in. But God is fitting you to fit perfectly into this same kingdom. To where on that day, when everyone sees you that has misjudged you now, they'll say, he's the servant of the Most High God. Yeah. It's exactly, he told me that, but I didn't believe him. They, they, that's, gonna, he's going to bring them before you, and they're going to have to bow down, they're going to have to confess that God was in you of a truth. Right. If you're in this kingdom, if you're being fitted for eternity, if God's in you of a truth, this is your reality. This is what your future is. The same kingdom. This is the kingdom, the same kingdom that will become visible when Jesus comes again. See, it's already there. We know we've, we've, already, we've already entered into this kingdom, and yet now it's by faith. Then it won't be by faith anymore. You won't need faith to see God anymore. You won't need faith to be able to perceive hope anymore. No, it, your hope will be realized. This king, the same kingdom that you've been initiated into, you've been grown up into, you've been fitted for, the same kingdom is going to be realized. And you're going to just enter, enter the joy of the Lord. I'm telling you, this, if this doesn't create hope in you, nothing will. This is what he's given. Behold, he cometh with clouds. And every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. You say, oh no. So even so, come Lord Jesus. This is exactly what we want. We'll never get so close to God that we'll feel comfortable in his presence. Never going to get so close to God to where you just can be casual. This is not our God. Our God is consuming fire. The beginning of wisdom what is it? It's the fear of the Lord. See, this, our God is the kind of God you come into his presence and you're never going to be distracted by something else going on. Your eyes will be focused on him and him alone. He is our great God of glory. God told Moses up on the mount, he says, you sanctify the priest that, 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 that will do his service. He says, and let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. That's is the priest he's talking about. The ones that are the closest ones to him while they're here on the earth. You see, so you be sanctified. Now, it took a while for Moses to see exactly what he was talking about. But later on, Nadab and Abihu, they offered strange fire unto the Lord. And remember, immediately Moses makes the connection. He sees it, and he tells, he tells Aaron in Leviticus 10, 3, Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Yeah. See, this is anyone. You see, it's dangerous to become a Christian. Christianity that's being offered to people today is far too casual. Far too casual. Are you sure? Are you really sure that you'll want to be a Christian? 
because he, all, any, all those that come nigh him, he will be sanctified. And now for Nadab and Abihu, you wouldn't really say that was for their benefit, would you? You wouldn't even look and say, well, that was good for them. He was sanctified in them. They come close to him, and God was sanctified in them, to be sure. People who promote a casual worship environment, whatever that is, are not bringing the people into the very presence of God. This is not what they're doing. It's something other than that, something where casualness can happen. It can't happen in the presence of God. Nowhere in the scripture was ever, anyone ever brought into the presence of God and they acted casual. It's not going to happen. We've been exposed to the mind of God concerning these things. The Apostle Paul hasn't held back anything. He hasn't held back exposing what is it to be a believer? What is it to walk by faith? What is it to give all diligent? What does it mean to be, to be um, chastened of the Lord? He hasn't held back anything that we require. He's told it like it really is. And now the end, the end of the matter is, why? Because our God is a consuming fire. These things have to be set in place. These things have to be given attention to because our God is a consuming fire. That's my prayer. Unto God that he would grant unto us to have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear because our God is a consuming fire. Thank you, brother.